So now that we remembered what sequential cl clocking is and defined the different types of um, parameters of a flip-flop and the two basic timing paths that we're going to check, we can move over to some algorithms of static timing analysis or why and how to calculate slack. Um, this section is heavily based on Rob Rutenbars from Logic to Layout, Lecture 12 from 2013. If you want to see a better and more detailed explanation, ex explanation, do yourself a favor and go see the original, one of the best courses and best teachers I've ever learned from. So, static timing analysis, or we often call it just STA. So, static timing analysis checks the worst case propagation of all possible vectors for min and max delays. The advantages of static timing analysis, and this is actually very, very cool. Um, it's much faster than timing driven gate level simulation, but the biggest thing is it's exhaustive. Exhaustive means that every single constraint timing path is checked. We may have millions of paths in our design, and we check every single one of them to find the worst case, to find any type of slack, which we will discuss what that is soon, um, that we have in our design and fix everything. And we do not need to generate any vectors of functional vectors of how the design is actually operating to, um, to do static time analysis. The disadvantage is, is that we, uh, we do not check proper circuit functionality. That we need to have different types of functional verification to check. And we also have to define timing requirements or our constraints that we'll discuss later. Um, and if we add all kinds of wrong timing requirements or exceptions, we may block real timing violations. Garbage in brings garbage out. So you have to be really careful and know what exactly you're defining and how it um, affects the design. So some limitations of uh, static timing analysis that we better know about, it's only useful for synchronous design. So if we're using asynchronous design, it doesn't um, necessarily at least know how to deal with this. Um, it doesn't know how to do things like cross, uh, clock domain crossing. Um, it cannot analyze combinational feedback loops. So if we have something like a flip-flop that's made out of basic gates, it will uh, drive the static timing analyzer nuts. Or if we have some sort of ring oscillator, any type of a combinational feedback loop, feedback that doesn't go through a sequential element. Is, uh, it won't work and you'll get warnings and errors from your synthesis tool or your timing checker. Okay. Another thing it does not check for glitching, glitching effects on asynchronous pins and uh, therefore we have to do different checks for this. So um, to start this we have to define what a timing path is. So a path is any type of a route that goes from a start point to an end point. We can see down here a kind of a picture of how we divide our design. We have our design that we're working on. The scope or the current design we're working on is this. It has a flip-flop and it has a combinatorial logic and another flip-flop and they get a clock that's input from a certain point and gets to all the flip-flops in the design. But there are paths that come from inputs to the design and paths that go to output to the design. There may be some combinatorial logic in between this input to the flip-flop, but we don't know where it comes from. Everything over here and everything over here is outside of our scope. It may be outside the chip or outside of the, the block that we are working on. We don't know what is there. Okay, As you see here, there is some sort of flip-flop or some element somewhere in the world that is clocked in some way because it is a synchronous design and it's somehow passing the data to us through some sort of a combinatorial loop. We don't know anything about that and we have to model it in order to make it fit our max delay and min delay constraints that only know how to deal with this register to register synchronous type of a path. Same goes here. We have this flip-flop here that's driving some sort of a, um, uh, a cloud here, a combinatorial cloud, and it reaches this output point, which we don't know anything that happens over here. And therefore, we have to make some sort of a model for this thing so we can deal with this just in the same way that we're dealing with our current design. Therefore, I'm going to now um, define that we, our start points are two types of things. First of all, it's the start point for a regular reg to reg path. And what we said is the thing that triggers the reg to reg path is this clock pin. So our start point is the clock pin of the flip-flops. Those are our regular start points in our design. Um, and then we have the uh, input ports to the design. These guys, they are also uh, start points for our design. Endpoints, well, 
uh, according to as this is a start point we also have this primary output or uh, port of our design that's an endpoint but the standard endpoint endpoints are these d um, uh, d pins of the flip-flops um, I just want to mention that you can have all kinds of hard macros such as memories they may have a clock pin so it's also a uh, both a start point and uh, the as an endpoint uh, the data pins of such a uh, of a, such a clock um, hard macro are also, are also endpoints note that there that this is a typical design or this is a small part of a typical design but you have flip-flops that can be uh, their clock pins are all start points and you have flip-flops that their data pins are endpoints and this guy can talk to uh, all these guys right so there can be many endpoints for each start point um, there can also be many start points for each endpoint maybe this goes somewhere around like that so we have all this whole mix this mesh of everything that can go to everywhere and in fact sometimes or often we can have two uh, paths that go from the same start point to the same endpoint. So there are lots and lots and lots, millions of these combinations of paths depending on the number of flip-flops we have in our design and the amount of logic, but mainly the number of flip-flops. Um, another thing that there are feedback paths. Feedback, if it goes through a flip-flop, is fine. So it could be actually that this flip-flop goes through some logic and then comes back to the deep end. So even uh, the same flip-flop can be the start point and the end point of the same of a single path. So so uh, a flip-flop can be both a start point and an end point in different paths or even in the same path. In static timing analysis, we usually categorize our design into four categories of timing paths. So we have our basic paths that we discussed before, and you can see a, a type of a, a, um, an illustration here that we'll use often in, 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 the, in future slides. But if we have everything in our design, we have the two flip-flops in our design, we know about the whole clock path in our design, we see the start point and the end point and everything in our design, that's called a reg-to-reg -reg path, register to register. We can time this without any external timing models. That's our favorite and uh, usually our most common type of a path. But that's not the only type of path. As we mentioned before, we have these types of um, um, paths that go from a flip-flop in our design through some sort of a combinational cloud to a, one of these uh, output ports. And in this case, we don't know anything about what's going on over here outside our module or outside our chip. And therefore, this is a different type of a path. And we call this a reg to out path from a register to the output. And we have to deal with it separately. Similarly, we have primary inputs or ports uh, to our design that come and they reach our um, our flip-flops and we don't know what's happening before them what generated them and what the clock was before that and so forth we'll have to model that so those are also uh, sep treated separately and those are called in to reg paths as you can see here and finally we have paths that are asynchronous they do not go through any flop they would be in to out paths and they just have a combinational delay um, inside the chip. So those are four types of paths that we'll be differentiating between and usually we'll separate them in our different timing reports. So now let's go over the goals of our static timing analysis algorithm. And what we want to do is we want to verify these max delay and the min delay constraints. We want to verify it for all paths in the design and make sure they're all met. Okay, we're going to start with a gate level net list. We're going to have timing models. The timing models are provided for every gate in the library. Without having timing models, we can't run our static timing analysis. And what we have to do, our goal is to report if any path violates the max and min delay constraints. But is that enough? And the answer is no. We want to know every path that violates the timing constraints. And we would also like to know in the order of their violation, how bad they violate them. Um, not only that, we also want to know where the violations occur. It's pretty amazing that we can actually do all of this in a pretty simple algorithm. It runs really quickly um, when you're discussing millions of paths. So we have to do some basic assumptions here for our algorithm. One is that our design is synchronous. As I said, the static time analysis algorithm do not uh, deal with asynchronous circuits. Okay, we will only show how to deal with combinational elements and max delay constraints, but you can easily adapt this to min delay constraints as well. Okay, um, we will assume a pin-to-pin -pin delay model. In other words, each gate has a single constant delay from instant to output. 
We know that in the real world, that is not true. Gate delay is affected by many factors, gate type, loading, waveform shape, transition direction, particular pin random variation, many other things affect this. And as we saw, these are all defined inside .lib files in the Liberty um, uh, format. Uh, but to make this simple, we're just going to use this pin-to-pin -pin delay model, which shows for every pin to every to uh, an output, we have a certain delay that's kind of normalized into some sort of a unit. Okay, and finally, we will take what's known as a topological approach. So a topological approach doesn't look at all at the logic functionality. We don't care if a gate is an AND or a MUX or a NOR. We just care that it's some sort of a gate with some sort of a timing relation between the input and output. And we're going to look at that and, and be able to to take it into a graph. If we had to look at a topological at the top topology uh, of, the, of the functionality of the graph, it makes it much more complex. And we'll have to discuss how this affects us later. So um, using those assumptions, we're going to de uh, develop this simple path representation. Let's say we have the following circuit. So we have two AND gates here, two inputs A and B. The output of this first AND gate is called C. Um, the input to this AND gate, the other input to the, this AND gate is called D. And the final output of the design is called E. We look into our standard cell library and we see that an AND gate is defined that from both inputs uh, input one and input two we have a timing arc uh, with a delay of two to the output okay what we're going to do is we're going to build a graph we're going to build a graph made out of vertices and edges a directed acyclic graph okay for each input and each internal node we are going to uh, create a vertice a wire okay um, there's one per each gate output with CMOS logic at least you're not allowed to drive uh, a, a certain output from two uh, gates so we're only going to have one of those nodes for each output um, and we're so we're going to have uh, one of these vertices for each start point each end point and each output of a gate so we have a b c d and e are all going to be vertices in our graph then we're going to have the edges and the edges are um, any of these arcs from input to output pin so we have from one from a to c one from b to c one from c to e and one from d to e as you can see here we're also going to write what the delay of each of those um, edges was. Finally, what we're going to do is a little trick here that's really cool. We're going to add a source and a sync node, a primary input and a primary output, so we can have all of our paths um, in, uh, looked at in one sweep. So what we do is we just add this source, and we know that the delay, the timing arc from the source to all of the primary inputs is just zero. And again, we put a, a, a sync um, that's connected to all the outputs, and the delay from the outputs to the sync is just zero, and that's going to help us deal with everything in one shot. Now, so what we're going to do is an algorithm called node-oriented timing analysis. Um, basically, you would think that what we would do is we'd enumerate every path. So we'd go look and write out every path, and we'd start to um, see what the delays are through it and check if it meets max delay and min delay. But very soon, we'd get this exponential explosion in the number of paths. We have millions of paths. It would take a long time to run such an algorithm. Instead, we'll use this node-oriented timing analysis that looks at um, the worst delay for each node along any path and there, thereby is able to find what the worst path is. For this we need to define two important values. One is arrival time at a node or at and this is the longest path from the source to the node. So we have the source, we have some sort of a node n and the at is the arrival time, the, the longest path uh, to get to node n. Okay. Then we have the required arrival time at node or the required time uh, often called the rat. So this is the latest time that the signal is allowed to leave the node and make it to the sync on time. And our slack is defined as the required time minus the arrival time. This, of course, is for a setup delay. So what our required time, what our capture time is, or the required time is similar to capture time, minus the uh, arrival time, which is how uh, long it took to get there. Um, so the delay of the launch path. Um, I like to show slack um, uh, with a little type of a rope and that's because I was in in uh, in boating in the Navy and in boating you have slack on a rope which is how much more room actually you have until the rope is too tight once the rope is too tight and you have negative slack that rope is going to rip so we would never want to have negative slack as Rod Brutenbar says negative slack is something you wouldn't want to wish on your worst enemy so how do we compute ats and rats 
Well, we do it like a lot of the different algorithms that we're going to be discussing in this course and that we've discussed so far. We do it recursively. Okay, so the arrival time at a node is just the maximum of the arrival times at all the predecessor nodes plus the delay from that node. This is described here in a very simple um, equation here. So the arrival time at node n is zero for the source and for any other node, it's the arrival time at all, uh, uh, the arrival time at its worst pre well, it's the arrival time at the predecessor plus the delay from the predecessor to n, and we take the maximum of all of those. So let's look at this graphically. We have all of these nodes here. They are the predecessors to n. They are all the nodes that drive the fan in basically to n. So we look at each one of these. We already know recursively what its arrival time is and we see how much the arrival time plus the delay of the edges and we take the the longest one of that those that is the arrival time at node n similarly when we want to find the required time uh, the required arrival time it's just the minimum of all the required arrival times at the successor nodes minus the delay to that node so when we want to look at the rat at node n first of all as a stopping point uh, at our sink, it's t, big T, right? That's the, the um, final required arrival time. It has to make it there before our uh, clock period. Um, and then for each of the other nodes, we have a minimum between the required arrival time at all these guys minus the edge from one of these successors to uh, the node itself. So we take all of these guys, we look at what the rat was to one of them, which we've already calculated, um, uh, subtract the edge that we have here, and the smallest of all those is the required arrival time. Let's see how we can, uh, first of all, let's try to understand this graphically. So this is the clock cycle time, or T. Um, that's the time it should take from the launch path to get to the end, um, and this is the capture edge. So that's the first edge of the clock and the second edge of the clock, and there is a, a time period of T between them. And what we have here is the at is the longest logic delay after the launch of the clock. So the at is the longest delay it could take for a, uh, a, a, for a signal to arrive um, a, at a certain node. The rat is the latest, it's the longest it could be and still make, uh, make it on time. And that way we have the rat, it had to make it by this time. It actually made it by this time. So when we take the rat minus the at, we get the slack. And what we have in green here is what's known as positive slack. And positive slack is good. That's what we want. That means we met our timing goal. On the other hand, if we look at a, a worst case where we have this long arrival time that ran here way past the halfway point of the, the clock, and we have this long required time that also ran way past uh, uh, the clock, when we take the required time minus the arrival time, what do we get? we get negative slack. And negative slack, as I said, is not something you want to wish on your worst enemy. So that's a timing violation. We don't want any negative slack in our design. Remember, though, on a setup path, which is what we're showing, we can always just make this clock period longer, and then we would arrive at a positive slack situation.